Well, a few questions will continue to confound the hair loss sufferer who wants to go on to finasteride, but several thoughts in his mind hold him back. And to this predicament, when you add other dimensions like male hypogonadism or testosterone replacement treatment, the matter becomes even more complex and at times difficult to comprehend. Well, to make matters simple for you is the purpose of this video. To clear the fog in your minds about clinically complex issues like hair loss, treatment of hair loss with medication like finasteride and of course the topic of the day male hypogonadism. I have dealt with the issues of finasteride in multiple videos and a link to the playlist is above and in the description box below kindly go through it. Those of you who pop the pill who pop finasteride without a thought without medical supervision rather casually need to know that a lot can go wrong if you do not heed rational medical advice. Otherwise, finasteride is a relatively safe drug. It has been with us for several decades now and the only drug that works for male pattern baldness. Today we have a hair loss sufferer here. Let's call him Bill and he has some issues about finasteride. Let's hear him out first and then towards the end of the video, I'll answer his questions that are linked to hair loss, use of finasteride, his male hypogonadism and advice regarding testosterone replacement treatment which he is about to start. A complex topic that should concern some people who suffer from male hypogonadism. So over to Mr. Bill. Hi Dr. Bhatti, sending you a voice message from over here in the States. I hope you're doing well. This is likely going to be far more information than you need, but I wanted to give you the full context of my situation as it is a bit unique to help contextualize my questions. And again, I'm just so glad and grateful that you're willing to engage with this and I hope it can prove useful for you and your community. I would of course humbly ask that all of it be kept totally anonymous. So, as you know from my recent email, I was recently diagnosed by my endocrinologist with hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, which makes me laugh a bit just because it's such a mouthful to say, uh, but he explained it to me as meaning that my testosterone and estrogen and free testosterone were all below the clinical range, but my LH and FSH were normal, implying that, in effect, my brain is numb to my low hormone levels and not sending adequate signal for production. Now, my troubles began about seven years ago when I was 20 years old, and I noticed the very, very early stages of hairline recession, and as someone in the performing arts, I panicked, and I went to a dermatologist who said, just take Propecia, you won't get any side effects, you'll get to keep your hair, and she didn't take any blood work. So I thought, great, and I started. For the first month or so on the drug, I actually kind of noticed a spike in libido, um, maybe it was a rise in testosterone, I know the drug can cause that, or maybe just elation from feeling like my worries were behind me. But about three months in, I noticed a big change. My libido went way down, I lost all morning erections, my ejaculate became watery, and so I went back to the dermatologist and told them about the side effects, and they did some blood work, they told me I was deficient in vitamin D, so I went on supplements for that, and I'm still on that to this day, but they said stay on the drug a bit longer and see if the side effects abate. They did not, and by April of 2014, about six months after starting, I noticed a new side effect, which was that my beard was growing more slowly, usually grew in quite thick and fast, and some of the hairs were turning red, and then blonde, and then miniaturizing. And at that point, I spoke with my primary care doctor, who advised me to stop the drug immediately, so I quit without tapering. And that summer... I slowly had a very, very slight improvement in the sexual side effects, nowhere near back to where I was before I started, but I also started experiencing more hair loss. My eyebrows started shedding a bit and thinning, my beard kept getting thinner, and my body hair thinned out quite a bit. I also noticed a gradual slight decrease in muscle mass over the next few months. And then over the following years, I saw a bunch of doctors trying to get to the bottom of it, and, you know, my cholesterol always came back very high, stubbornly high, even though I wasn't testing positive for diabetes or anything like that. And I always just got told, lose weight, you know, bring your anxiety down, get better sleep. And I found that no matter how hard I worked to get better, these things were continuing. 
So when the pandemic happened, I was afforded a bit of a pause in my professional life and decided I'm going to be a detective and get to the bottom of all this. So I went to an endocrinologist and he gave me this diagnosis of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. He sent me for an MRI so we could rule out a pituitary lesion that thankfully came back totally normal. He was admittedly not familiar with the somewhat controversial reports of persistent side effects from finasteride, but he did propose the possibility that the drug may have unmasked something I was already destined for. So that's pretty much the whole story, uh, and it does leave me with a few questions, which I already mentioned to you by email, but I'll restate here for convenience. So the first is, could these low hormone issues be responsible for my beard and eyebrows gradually thinning and lightening and growing slower over the past few years? And as a follow-up to that, could the inadequate hormones also be negatively impacting my head hair, which has thinned, continued to thin as well, although it's slowed a lot thanks to minoxidil? And then the thornier question that I have is, do you think finasteride could have induced this condition or perhaps unmasked or accelerated a condition I was already predisposed to? I long ago learned the horrors of those awful internet forums that are just rife with panic and misinformation. And that's why I want to ask this admittedly controversial question of someone who I know is deeply experienced with this drug and with prescribing it. So I would be grateful for any any thoughts you have on how the timing of all this might or might not be related. And then lastly, I'm currently deciding between Clomid or TRT as a treatment option for this, and I'd welcome any thoughts that you have on the matter as well as any alternates that you think might exist to correct something like this. So that's everything kicking around in my head right now. Um, it sounds like a lot, but I actually feel really, really happy that I'm finally getting answers and can begin the work of getting my body into a more positive feedback loop with itself. And again, I just want to say I'm so grateful that I discovered you and your channel, and I think it's wonderful that you are providing such a calm, clear, and nuanced and in-depth source of information for all of these topics because there are a lot of guys out there like me who need it and I think it's a tremendous service that you're providing so thank you again for your selflessness and all this and just wishing you all my best and I hope you have a great week and take care so before I answer these questions let's go through an overview of what he's suffering from hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism and we are only covering this issue as it relates to male pattern baldness Impaired testicular function is referred to as male hypogonadism and this can affect spermatogenesis or formation of sperms and also the release of testosterone from the testes. And mind you, this is not an uncommon problem. So low testicular function or male hypogonadism can be of two types. Number one, primary or hypergonadotropic hypogonadism. The second type is secondary hypogonadism. So let's cover first hypertropic hypogonadism and then we'll go on to hypogonadotropic hypogonadism or secondary hypogonadism, the one which Bill is suffering from. So first we deal with primary hypogonadism, hypertropic hypogonadism, quite a mouthful as he says. This is the most commonly found hypogonadism in the adult male. The Massachusetts male aging study revealed a crude incidence rate of about 12.3 per 1000 males every year leading to an estimated prevalence of 481,000 new cases of late onset hypogonadism every year in American men 40 to 69 years of age. The symptoms of this primary hypogonadism are low libido, impaired erectile function, muscle weakness, increased adiposity or fat deposit, depressed mood and decreased vitality. This hypergonadotropic hypogonadism or what we call as primary hypogonadism is characterized by low production of testosterone and elevated levels of follicular stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone as can be seen in the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. So this primary hypogonadism or what we call as hypertropic hypogonadism can be either congenital that is occurring by birth or acquired. The most common form of congenital hypogonadism is Klinefelter syndrome, which occurs 1 in 500 males. On the other hand, the acquired form of primary hypogonadism can be of two types. Number one, due to male aging, and this affects almost about 5% men in the age group of 40 to 49 years, and about 10% of men in the age group 60 to 70 years. 
The other form is exposure to toxic agents, toxic agents called gonadotoxic agents, which are toxic towards the gonad, that is the testes. And this includes chemotherapy, radiotherapy for cancer. These can cause gonadal failure and affect the leading and the Sertoli cells in the testes. And now we come to what Bill is suffering from, male hypogonadotropic hypogonadism or secondary hypogonadism. It may be due to a congenital or an acquired disease that affects the hypothalamus or the pituitary gland which are situated in the brain and which are directly linked to the secretion of testosterone from the testes. In these patients, the secretion of gonadotropin releasing hormone is inadequate and the prevalence has been estimated as 1 in 10,000 to 1 in 86,000 and therefore this is not as common as primary hypogonadism and this can be due to any of these on the on my right hand side I don't want to delve into each of them individually because it will be beyond the ambit of this talk so you can go through this if you have any doubt any question about this you can leave a question in the comment section below and this can cause any of these symptoms now treatment of secondary hypogonadism or hypotropic hypogonadism may include Testosterone supplementation, which can be either through testosterone injections, testosterone patches or testosterone gel. It can also include gonadotropin releasing hormone injections or HCG injections. Now we come to Bill's questions, the questions he wanted to ask me, the clarifications he wanted to seek about his hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, secondary hypogonadism that he's suffering from. And he's very concerned about his hair loss and he's going to go on to TRT injections and he's quite apprehensive about how it will affect his hair loss and how to move forward. And it does leave me with a few questions, which I already mentioned to you by email, but I'll restate here for convenience. So the first is, could these low hormone issues be responsible for my beard and eyebrows gradually thinning and lightening and growing slower over the past few years? Absolutely. The androgens determine the secondary sexual characteristics and beard is one of them. However, I am not very certain about why the eyebrow hair is growing slow now that you have stopped use of finasteride. If it were because of finasteride, the slow growth would have got reversed by now. And then the thornier question that I have is, do you think finasteride could have induced this condition or perhaps unmasked or accelerated a condition I was already predisposed to? I long ago learned the horrors of those awful internet forums that are just rife with panic and misinformation. And that's why I want to ask this admittedly controversial question of someone who I know is deeply experienced with this drug and with prescribing it. So I would be grateful for any thoughts you have on how the timing of all this might or might not be related. The male pattern baldness gene predisposes your follicles to even minuscule amounts of DHT. DHT levels need not be high or low to affect your follicles. A small concentration of DHT can be inimical to the health of your follicles when you have inherited the male pattern baldness gene. And this is the reason why estimation of DHT levels is of no use in male pattern baldness to assess anything about male pattern baldness. No matter how much androgen is circulating in your body, you are destined towards male pattern baldness depending upon how deeply the gene of male pattern baldness is encrypted. And this is besides other environmental factors, which we call epigenetics. Yes, it likely did unmask your problem. However, though finasteride has been used for several decades now and is considered a relatively safe drug, in some cases, like in yours, it is unpredictable. And this is because the function of the enzyme 5-alpha reductase that finasteride seeks to inhibit is not yet very well understood. Now, DHT is the most potent human androgen and it impacts several tissues like prostate, seminal vesicles, hair follicles, skin function, kidneys, prostate gland, and the eyes. Its broader physiological roles in liver, in pancreatic beta cell function, health of the eye, kidney function are emerging but not yet fully understood. 5-alpha reductase, which finasteride inhibits and slows down the formation of DHT. So 5-alpha reductase is a family of several isoenzymes. And it plays an important role in human physiology by regulating cellular metabolism of androgens, glucocorticoids, and other steroids. It is a rate-limiting step in the biosynthesis of neuroactive steroids in the brain, which are critical for central nervous system function. 5-alpha reductase isozymes are expressed in several tissues in the body. 
Finasteride and dutasteride are synthetic 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. These synthetic drugs are prescribed commonly for hair loss for benign prostate hypertrophy since a long, long time. The inhibition of 5-alpha reductase by finasteride may induce a tissue-specific androgen deficiency independent of testosterone levels. So therefore, long-term use of finasteride without medical supervision may be deleterious to your health. Though finasteride has been in use for treating male pattern baldness, androgenic alopecia, male hair loss, that is genetic, for several decades now and is considered tolerable and safe, the entire spectrum of side effects is quite well known. The medicine should be only sparingly used in the right person. Yes, Mr. Bill, the several pictures that you've sent, I've studied. You're suffering from androgenic alopecia, definitely. For your hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, secondary hypogonadism. And then lastly, I'm currently deciding between Clomid or TRT as a treatment option for this, and I'd welcome any thoughts that you have on the matter, as well as any alternates that you think might exist to correct something like this. So that's everything kicking around in my head right now. Yes, testosterone replacement therapy is in order. And I have discussed this topic in great detail in a video which I produced some years back. And you can go to the link above, click it, and you will know all about TRT, about hair loss and the use of finasteride. Well, that is a talk for the day. If you have any questions, any thought in your mind about hair loss, use of finasteride, side effects of finasteride, or use of other treatments, hair loss treatment for men and women, let me know. Put a comment in the comment section below and I'll be happy to respond. Have a nice day and if you haven't subscribed yet, please do. Your encouragement keeps the channel going. God bless you.